Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. Open phones this hour. Jack starts us off from Chicago. Hey, Jack, welcome into the Ask Noah Show. Hi, it's good to be be on the show. Um, I called in last week, uh, kind of talking about WireGuard and getting a, a home server set up, and yes. I got pretty stuck. And I called in, and what you, uh, the information you gave me, and kind of some of the debugging points, really got me through a few hurdles. So now I have, uh, you know, Open Project, a password manager, like all this stuff running kind of out of the cloud and on my own hardware and stuff. And so, yeah, I just want to call in and say it worked, and thank you. You know what? That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. A lot of times we don't get uh, follow up, so I guess I'll ask: Was the advice worth what you paid for it? <laughs> yeah, totally worth the money. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the advice was worth it, and uh, I, I kind of like. There were some more things past that, but I just had this uh, this hump. Uh, you know, kind of. I'm a developer, and so sometimes the IT things and just the debugging things and where to even look for debugging kind of uh, you know goes over my head. But I understand the kind of the coding part, so it was really good to kind of get the the kind of practical how to start the the debugging process and stuff. So, so for, for the next person out there, the next person that's sitting it down and saying to themselves. I want my network to be more secure. I want a better way to access my home network when I'm outside the office or outside the home. How easy is WireGuard to set up once you kind of get your head wrapped around it? WireGuard is by far the easiest thing I've had to set up. I really, it's, it's getting a few of the primitives and a few things like in your head. But once that happens, like um, I set up one computer and then the next two or three, I actually have three computers now all using WireGuard. It was very seamless. It's the it's kind of getting the, the idea of like what the well, you know what are these endpoints and IPs and allowed stuff and how does all you know kind of fit together. But once once you kind of get it like and that might just be because I, I don't have as much experience with it. But once you get that all in your head, setting up the next uh, the next service, the next uh, you know kind of computer is really easy and highly rec- it's so much easier than OpenVPN or all the other things. So yeah, yeah. It, ta- it takes having set OpenVPN up a couple of times to really start to appreciate the simplicity and efficiency of WireGuard. I think. I always kind of question OpenVPN, and I've had it not work on a device, and then just like not fixed it because it just it was so much of a headache. Mm-hmm. And with WireGuard, it feels so stable. It's one text file, and there's so few things to look at that. Um, and there's no like where are these certs or anything like that. It's it's the string is the like encryption key and stuff that my confidence level that it will continue to work, and my confidence level of like it working is just so much. It's it's a really good feeling. So yeah, no, I would highly recommend it to anyone who wants to do, um, you know, a home VPN to start self-hosting and, and keeping a lot of stuff, uh, you know, kind of on your own hardware. To me, it just kind of reminds me of setting up SSH. I mean, I feel like when you get to the point of exchanging, a, you know, a key pair, and then that's what you need for your crypto to be in place. Uh, you know, it's it's not unlike it's not unlike setting up SSH. It feels a lot like SSH. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So awesome. Well, I, yeah, you know what? Uh, I, I, I'm really glad, Jack, that it worked out. And obviously, as you continue to do more cool things with your home network, uh, please give us a call and let us know, because, of course, we'd like to keep tabs on it. Yeah, I'll let you know, and uh, I'll come back if any questions. Thank you so much. S- sounds good. Thanks for the call, Jack. 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. We have so much stuff to get to tonight. I there is Well, there's no way we're going to get through this entire show, Doc. And uh, if you're only listening to the show, then you're only getting half the show because the rest of the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Yeah, that's where we stash the rest of the articles that we didn't have time to dig into in their full entirety. So much stuff in the Linux and technology space has happened this week. I want to start, though, with something that probably like the least important, (laughs) interestingly enough, but I'm so excited about it personally that I'm hoping I can energize a movement around this stupid thing. I've been a huge proponent of USB-C since the day I got a laptop enabled with USB-C. I think it is the best, most awesome invention 
ever in the face of technology. I mean, the idea that I have a single connector that can power my laptop, that can power my cell phone, that everything can be connected to, the fact that we have, we've layered intelligence into the actual connector itself, so the devices can negotiate which way power is flowing, the fact that we can tie a bunch of different protocols behind it, if we want to layer Thunderbolt behind it, if we want to layer just DisplayPort, if we want just a USB bus, it is the, I've never had a connector break, it's great to be able to put it in face up or face down. Unlike the lightning connector, you don't have to worry about any of the pins rusting. I don't have a bad thing to say about USB-C. And this week, something really cool, a new product uh, arrived at my doorstep, and I got a chance to play with it, and I'm excited to tell you about it. It is the Leviton USB-C wall outlet. So what this thing is, is it replaces your traditional wall outlet. So you, you take a screwdriver, you pull your actual wall outlet out, and you put this Leviton device in replacement wall outlet it will do up to 30 watts USB-C power delivery USB-C PD so you're able to charge your ThinkPad you're able to charge your MacBook you're able to charge your iPad Pro you're able to charge any cell phone that runs off of USB-C the nice thing about this this outlet is it removes the requirement to ha carry around a power brick so over by my night side uh, bed stand, I have replaced the wall outlet with one of these Leviton USB-C power outlets. And I've done the same thing in my kitchen and I've kind of created this little charging station. So people come over, I've got all of the little cables that you could possibly need. I've got a lightning cable, I've got a micro USB, I've got a mini USB, I've got a, a straight USB-C to USB-C. And they're all sitting there in this little charging cradle thing that I bought it at, uh, at, a, at a home store. And then I've got my little Leviton outlet. And so I'm able to go from room to room and plug into my laptop. Now, the thing is, this was not an easy journey. And this is part of what makes it so exciting for me to come on the air and talk about this. I think this is probably the fifth one I've purchased. The other four did not work with my laptop. They would work with, uh, they would work with very small laptops. If you had like the 12 inch, I think the MacBook uh, Air, it would charge that. But it would not, and it would charge like the iPad Pro, but it would not charge anything larger. And so I've got my my big old ThinkPad, and I need to be able to charge. Now, it's not, is it going to charge as fast as the 45 watt or the 60 watt or the 87 watt? No, of course not. It's 30 watts. But if you just need to maintain your device, or at, for me, at night when I'm charging my laptop up, I don't want a 90 watt device charging my laptop. Why? What kills lithium ion batteries? Heat. How do you generate heat inside of a lithium ion battery? Shove 90 watts down its throat. That's how. So I want it to charge as slow and gently as possible because it's got eight hours to charge. It doesn't have to do it fast. It's just when I wake up in the morning, I need it ready to go. I have a stand that I, I that uh, like a, a standing desk thing that I use in the morning as I'm kind of getting ready and checking email and preparing for the day and so on and so forth. I've replaced the outlet above that. And there, I don't necessarily need it to, again, speed charge. I just need to maintain the battery life in the laptop so that I don't start my day three hours in uh, at 90% or whatever. Uh, and so these little things, I just, I can't buy enough of them and they're awesome. And I'll have a link for you in the show notes. If you are involved with, if you have a lot of technology, these are the things you want to put in your house because they enable you and your kids and your family members and anybody that comes over to your house to just plug a single cable into this USB-C outlet and charge their device. And you don't have to worry about, oh, did I have the little brick dongle thing and does it work with this one and that one and this, that, and the edge? No, everything should be USB-C. And this just further completes my life. So not the most exciting piece of technology news out there, uh, but so, probably the thing I'm most excited about today, as weird as that sounds. Again, phone lines, 855 450 no if you'd like to call or add your voice to the conversation we'd love to take your calls your calls as always go to the front of the line there has been a, another intel attack or another vulnerability that has been discovered now this is called the zombie load attack and it is an approach to a microarchitect data sampling and so it's this is a new security flaw that was discovered actually while we were on the air last week i think and the idea is that you can read code that has been previously stored on the CPU, residual code. So it's not necessarily, you're not going to get, you know, like everything another user has done, but you may be able to grab residual pieces of data. Now, the threat vector is fairly limited in that you have to have code running on the victim's machine to begin with. In other words, if 
you don't allow physical access to your machine, you don't allow people to get into your machine and store code and execute code on your machine, then you're essentially safe from this particular vulnerability. So from that perspective, the threat vector is very low. The problem is, whether we know it or not, a lot of times we let people have other access to our machines. No, I don't do that. I secure SSH and I turn off all of the unneeded services. Right, and then you run it on a VPS, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're running it on a box with other people, and other people have access to that same box. And that's really where this threat comes into play, is on cloud-based providers, especially with the transition, again, away from virtualized computing and back into on the hardware computing and using containers like Kubernetes to establish the same kind of boundaries and security protocols. We talked to a gentleman at Red Hat when we were at Red Hat Summit. One of the things I talked to him about is I asked him, where he thought the future of container technology was and what he was seeing in the industry. I think the exact question I asked him was, do you see businesses retooling their virtual infrastructure to come back to running things on the hardware, but inside of containers? And he said, yes, absolutely. I do. That is the trend in it right now is to come back off of virtual servers and come back onto running right on the, on the bare metal to reduce complexity and then to retain the security environment that you would want and containerization, we're relying on the security mechanisms of those containers. Well, the problem is if all of these containers are accessing the same CPU and this code gets deposited on that machine, now everybody that, that shares that machine, quote unquote, not everybody, but every container technology that's sharing that machine is subject to this. So they have issued a fix. And unfortunately, it's not great news. So the fix for Mac is the worst. It's only available on the latest version of macOS Mojave, and it if you apply the fix, it can cause up to a 40% reduction in performance. 40% reduction in in performance. Now, on Linux and Windows, it's a little bit better. Obviously, Linux the fix is coming in through the kernel updates, so if you want to make sure that your system is safe from this particular vulnerability, the best thing to do is to stay up to date on the kernel. If you do that, what they're seeing right now on PC Linux and, and, and Windows is about a 15% reduction in performance. And so essentially the only way to mitigate a lot of these attacks is to disable or not use uh, Intel hyperthreading. And so this, is a, this continues to be a major blow to Intel. Now what's interesting is a lot of people on the internet are jumping on the Ryzen bandwagon and saying, listen, if we just go to AMD, that solves this problem, right? I mean, we don't have this problem on AMD and you have that problem on Intel. And so Intel is clearly a less superior infrastructure and has some more security vulnerabilities. So let's just switch over to Ryzen or some sort of AMD platform. You won't have that problem. Well, the argument against that, I guess, would be AMD, yes, does, has not have the same amount of discovered vulnerabilities as Intel has, in part due to the fact that there are more people looking at Intel than they are at AMD. And additionally... Intel has been continuing to try to push the needle forward to try to advance their, I guess, uh, interests in data centers and in high performance computing. And so as that occurs, obviously, they're trying to find newer and faster ways to crunch data. And sometimes those are going to come with a vulnerability. So I guess my answer to that would be when when an AMD platform is rolled out at the same scale that Intel is. I guess then we can maybe begin to have more of a discussion and compare apples to apples. Right now, I'm inclined to say that we, it, it, it's not really a fair comparison to Intel. And I think Intel's kind of getting a bad rap over that. And I feel a little bad that um, they're taking it as bad as they are uh, because they can't seem to get a break. I mean, it's becoming the butt of jokes inside of every IT circle that Intel is just plagued with all of these problems. So this affects all Intel CPUs, everything made after 2011 is the information that we have. And so if you have a Intel CPU that is that is manufactured after 2011, then you're going to want to update. Now, our resident AMD fanboy in the chat room, Das Geek, says, eh, looking into the issue at all, they test on those same vulnerabilities across the board. And so what he's saying there is, these Intel, this, these Intel vulnerabilities are discovered on Intel, but the reality is that we look at all processors to try to discover these vulnerabilities. It's just Intel keeps coming up to the surface. So maybe there is something there. Again, not really an issue if it's just your machine. If it is on a public cloud machine, again, probably still not really your issue because your VPS provider is going to handle that for you, right? 
or at least you would expect them to. Hey, we have a new phone system and I'm really excited about it. So if you go to asknoahshow.com, you now can make a call into the program at absolutely no charge and you don't even have to have a phone. It uses a custom web RTC engine that we've embedded into the site. And so when you click on the little button, it generates a, a, a web RTC a calling session and sends an RTP audio stream back to the studio here. It comes in through our regular broadcast phone system. We're able to take your call. We're able to have a conversation. You're able to hang up totally anonymous because it doesn't, we don't log anything. We don't track anything. You can make up a name if you want to, and you're able to participate in the program. Why did we do that? Well, we want to allow people from outside the country to participate. And we understand that there are, it can be inconvenient if you have to rely on the traditional phone system to place a call. Now we have a toll free number, so it should be free to you anywhere in the world anyway, but we thought we would make it a little bit easier. Most geeks are sitting behind their computer anyway. The only thing we would ask is please use a USB headset, some sort of a, it doesn't have to be USB, but some sort of a headset, something to separate the audio that we're sending you from the audio that you're sending us. That way we don't get echoes and feedback and stuff like that. So please don't use it with your microphone built into your, your laptop or anything like that. Um, you could use it on your phone. I've heard that works pretty well. So again, asknoahshow.com, right in the lower right-hand corner, click on call the show while the show is live, which of course is Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, and uh, you can join us that way. Or of course, you can continue to call us at 855-450-NOAH. Those phone lines going to stay open. Big news this week, South Korea's government is switching to Linux. Now, they're mainly doing this for cost savings, but also to prevent Windows from becoming a monopoly. What you're noticing around the world and in most businesses, people are becoming very hip to the idea of vendor lock-in, and they don't like it. People don't want to be locked in to a given company or a given service. And other countries are particularly concerned about that because they don't like relying on a relationship with the United States in order to run their government services or, or public interests. So the cost of the changeover has been estimated around $655 million. And the catalyst for this is Windows 7 reaching end of life in January. So unless you have one of those fancy, very expensive extended maintenance contracts from Microsoft, your systems are going to cease to receive security updates and patches after January at the, uh, next year. And so if you're uh, another country, your choice is to pay for a upgrade to Windows 10, which is A, probably going to be expensive. B, it continues to tie you to the United States, the United States government and the United States company. C, you're locked into that company. So never mind the political ramifications of it. Let's just talk about the fact that you're tied to a given company, whether you want to be or not. You're tied to that company's decision and you don't have any autonomy. And so what North, uh, what, uh, North Korea obviously has for a long time been looking at uh, or using a custom Linux distro. I believe it's, is it Red Linux? Is that the name of it? But now South Korea is going to do something very similar. Microsoft may actually step in and try to talk them out of this. And the reason I say that is Microsoft did in fact step in and try to talk Munich out of this when they went through this just a few years ago. Now, the interesting situation, and a lot of people have been comparing it to the Munich changeover, and it's because Munich actually rolled back. But I argue that there is a, a little bit different, there, there's, there is a difference between these two countries and that we are living in a different time. So first of all, the changeover with Munich uh, was back when Steve Ballmer was in charge of Microsoft. And at that time, Microsoft was an operating systems focused company, a desktop operating systems focused company. Today, Microsoft themselves would tell you that they're not a desktop operating systems focused company. They're a cloud services focused company, cloud first. And that's what Microsoft is really concentrating on. Additionally, the ecosystem around operating systems in general has changed since the time that Munich switched over. Back when Munich switched over, I think there were a lot of people that were running local software on their Windows boxes, and they needed to be running that local software to interface with other agencies and other governments. In 2019 and in 2020, as this change is going to take place, I believe that the ecosystem has changed. I believe that there is a lot more acceptance of web-based document editing and spreadsheet editing and collaborative editing Microsoft's own Office Suite, if you're on a 365 subscription, is functional inside of Linux, and you can run that inside of a web browser. 
South Korea also has said that the office suite that they're currently using is not Microsoft Office. And so it, they likely believe that it will be very compatible with the LibreOffice suite or a alternative. South Korea, right now, they're doing a test rollout. And uh, Microsoft doesn't seem to be too concerned. Microsoft really seems to be making most of their money these days off of services. And so there's a lot of speculation that Microsoft is going to go, meh, no big deal. Now, I pulled the original Tech Republic article from Munich so I could refresh my memory on exactly what went wrong in the Munich situation as to not so much offer advice, but maybe offer some insight into what might happen this time around. The head of the IT department said that they had solved all of the compatibility problems relating to running line of business software on what they were calling Limix. They were able to swap documents with outside organizations, and the compatibility issues that were listed were solely for political reasons, and there was no technical reason for Munich to change off of LibreOffice and Linux, the Linux operating system that they designed specifically for Munich. Quote, we solved all the compatibility and in interoperability problems by providing Microsoft Office mostly virtualized at the workstations that need to work with external organizations using Office documents, he said. In general, we know of no major technical problems with Linux and LibreOffice, he added. So first of all, they're, uh, maybe I took a uh, play out of their book or they're taking a play out of my book because that's exactly what we do. We virtualize any of the things that we need in Windows and then spit them back into the Linux box. Works great. But there were no technical reasons to move off of Linux. So the, why did Munich do that? I believe they moved off of Linux for a couple of reasons. I think that part of it was a political and social reasons. I also think that Balmer getting on a plane, even though Munich didn't cave at that time, I think it really put into focus how much pressure Microsoft was applying for that situation. And it's probably safe to assume that that pressure did not die down just because Munich stopped talking about it. I think that most of these rollouts and most of any operating system changeover comes essentially in two port phases. The first phase is the actual announcement phase of the, of the operating system changeover. So they say, we intend to drop Windows 7 and we intend to go over to a Linux-based platform, which we're going to write from scratch or we're going to adopt a major distribution, whatever it is. And then the second phase is after it actually rolls out. Now, what you saw in the Munich case was Balmer got on a plane during the first phase. So they tried to head off that problem early on. And the reason that they do that is because Steve Balmer and anybody with two brain cells to rub together understands that the time to strike is before they've actually made any investment. While they're still on Windows 7, if somebody from Microsoft were to go over to South Korea and say, hey guys, we understand that there's a push to uh, upgrade and you're not going to receive security updates. And so obviously you're considering going over to Linux. And that makes a lot of sense. It's a very open source operating system. And as you're probably aware, we at Microsoft love open source and Linux, but we will make you a heck of a deal if you want to upgrade to Windows 10. We'll just, we'll give you, I don't know, 60%, 70% off, something like that, right? And we'll just upgrade all of your machines to Windows 10 and you lessen the friction to go to Windows 10. Well, now, now you're at an impasse because you have all of your users that have come up in a particular environment. You've got all of your software tools for a particular environment. Everybody is used to it. The rest of the world, for better or for worse, kind of accepts Microsoft as the go-to business standard and government standard. And so if you can get that done for an acceptable price, why don't you? It's going to be much harder in phase two. That is, once they start rolling this stuff out, they're obviously going to hit some pain points. And so there is another opportunity for Microsoft or even Apple to come in there and say, hey, you guys are running into some problems. We can help you with that. Instead of this Linux open source thing, why don't you come back to a well-known, well-established industry-run uh, software and come back and run Windows? The issue that I think Microsoft or any other company is going to face at that point is those pain points are getting less and less as Linux gets more and more mature. So if you're running G Suite or you're running any sort of web-based software, it doesn't really matter if you're running it inside of Windows or inside of Linux. And as we've seen industry-wide, virtually across any industry you want to pick, web-based software is where software development is going. Nobody's writing local software anymore. If it's any sort of wide deployment, they're probably putting that on the web. 
Consider this. I was re going through some Reddit posts from people from South Korea that were talking about what their government does and how they use their software. And essentially, they have a lot of custom security packages that, that must be installed to view particular documents or register for certain services, this, that, and the other. And what they have been, what they found is that they already make a lot of those packages for Linux. And so the speculation is they're not going to hit a lot of pain points. And so if Microsoft does as it, by all appearances, it, it seems that they're going to, which is just to let this ride, what they're going to wind up with is this is going to be a smooth transition for South Korea. And if that works, you've got North Korea that's on Linux, you've got South Korea, which is on Linux. I think there starts to be a trend and a transition into free and open source software for government use because it's more responsible to the ta taxpayer. It's more compatible. You're not beholden to any government or any company. I think it makes a lot of sense. 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. Joel from Georgia joins us. Hey, Joel, welcome into the program. Long time no talk, Noah. Hey, man, how we doing? So uh, I'm doing fine, and I uh, just hanging in there. Just got out of uh, doing over. I uh, just got out of an overtime shift that I was able to do today. So yay! <laughs> That's awesome. Alrighty. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to uh, first uh, ask you about with the with, with the recent Spectre and melt with the recent Spectre vulnerability that just got announced this week. Yeah, zombie. What are your thoughts on the recent and yeah, zombie load and all that. What are your thoughts on the recent announcement for the uh, new ThinkPad that's coming with All Ryzen? I think that anytime you have competition in the market, it's a good thing for everybody, right? Rather Ryzen turns out to be a good, uh, rather Ryzen turns out to be the choice for people or not. The fact that there's another player in the game means that Intel has to actually innovate and has to actually compete and has to look over their shoulder and say, hey, they weren't affected by that vulnerability. Consider this for a second. Consider, if you will, that there was no Ryzen, that AMD really didn't offer a competitor to Intel and this vulnerability came out, would any? Would you think anybody would really be talking about it? Or would we just say, this is a vulnerability, but hey, you know what? It affects every machine out there. I mean, we just patch it and we move on. What can we do, right? The fact that Ryzen mm. exists and the fact that there are Ryzen laptops out there and the fact that there are people like Das Geek in our chat room that are, uh, that are extolling the virtues and benefits of a Ryzen or AMD-based platform means that Intel has to continually look over their shoulder and do Better. And it also means that AMD and Ryzen have to do better to actually sell processors in that market because Intel, let's face it, for all of Intel's flaws, it's still a pretty high bar. They still make a pretty high quality product that you can get a lot of work done and works very well. There's very few people that I know, even post Spectre and Meltdown, that have purchased a new Intel processor, fired it up in their computer and went, yeah, the performance on this thing really, really terrible. Most people are pretty happy with it. You know, you get a new computer, you're pretty happy with it. So I, I think the bar was set high to begin with, and I think Ryzen challenges that, and I think that's a good thing. Well, I mean, at least it's a ThinkPad T-series rather than a ThinkPad E-series or any other lower model, and I'm I'm actually very excited. And this is like, I'm actually considering this laptop, looking at it long-term as my, one of my first purchase personal purchases for a laptop. So I, I've been really excited ever since I heard the announcement. I, I guess I hadn't seen the T series. I saw I saw the E forty five what if four eighty five or whatever. It was was there a T series that had a Ryzen two? Yeah, well this is the well the difference between that E series and the T series, the T series is second gen Ryzen, the T four nine five and the four nine five S. There's also a X three nine five if I'm not mistaken. There was there was an announcement this week this week or last week about the new models that are getting released uh, this year. Okay, I am not... F oh, yeah, here it is. Huh, how did I miss that? Yeah, the ThinkPad T495, 14-inch, 3.4-pound laptop with AMD Ryzen CPU. That is really and is cool. Second, and this is second-gen, not first-gen, second-gen Ryzen. Did you say there was an X-Series that, that they would release, too, with Ryzen? Yeah, it was like X3. I know it... Begins with three, three X three, and ends with a five. I know all the Ryzen's end with five for some reason. Yeah, I don't know you're what right. The is, it's a ThinkPad X three ninety five. So here's what's interesting about them releasing a X series with a Ryzen processor. The number one complaint or the number one discussion point about Ryzen processors is that they don't handle heat as well as Intel does. The fact that Ivy or that uh, Lenovo is willing to ship 
a Ryzen processor inside of the X series, which for those of you who aren't ThinkPad snobs like I am, uh, the the X series is their ultra portable series. So the fact that they're willing to ship a Ryzen processor in an X series means they must be actually handling the heat pretty well because there isn't a large fan, there's not a large heat sink, there's not a large anything because it's a 13.3 ultra portable computer. Yeah, and also, don't they have, like, some sort of a different schema of, like, cores compared to Intel, sort of, and with the hyper-threading as well yes. being a little different? All righty. I really do appreciate you taking my call. It's been a long time, and hope you have a good rest of your show. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Joel. I appreciate the call. 855-450-NOAA. It's 855-450-6624. Man, this 390, uh, 395 looks like a really incredible computer. So you've got... Um, You've got USB-C for AC power. You've got USB 3.1. Would have been nice to see a Thunderbolt connector, uh, but we'll take the USB 3.1. No wired Ethernet, which is unfortunate. Um, you've got two regular USB Type A, an HDMI port, and a headphone jack, and a smart card reader. Um, so that will be an interesting product when that release. Now, it's not out yet. It's It says it's coming soon. Um, of course, we'll have a link to the... ThinkPad X395 in the show notes. You can see those at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Charlie from Australia, you're on Ask Noah. Welcome to the program. Good day, Noah. Good day, everyone. Uh, um, I finally installed Ubuntu 19.04, um, and I must say it's probably the best Linux I've played with on my PC for two years. Really? Are you using it with no? Uh, no, a proper desktop UI. <laughs> I'm running it with Mate. Okay. So it's working very well for you. Now, you and were a huge fan. The what was the... I'm what, calling up about is with Mumble, actually. The APT Get Mumble keeps on auto-updating the 1.3 build, and it seems to have issues with the Pulse Audio. So I'll be talking to someone on a microphone on my Mumble server, and it'll just cut out. And then I'll have to restart Mumble, reset the actual config of the microphone and everything and then it'll work and then it'll cut out. So the solution I found temporarily to get around this issue was just to remove mumble through the APT system and use it in a snap. Mm. But the 1.29 snap doesn't work with importing certificates. The, so, say, uh, run yeah, that by me one more time. What's the version that's problem, in the snap? But um, I can always research these other problems. What was the what's the version that's included in the snap? For Mumble? Charlie? Do we lose you? All right, give me a call back. 855-450. No, that's 855-450-6624. Uh the so I I was I was just looking. I I wonder if you don't need to update that snap. Now I, I admittedly I missed the exact version that he said that he had installed, but it looks like the one point yeah, I guess it is. 1.2.19 is the latest that we have available in the in the Snap Store. That's interesting. Uh, and it was published August 21st, 2018, so it's been a little bit since it has been updated. I will poke some people for you, Charlie, and I'll see if we can't get that updated. I, I tell you what, for the first time in my life, a Snap package solved a problem for me. Uh, this last week, I was going to download a video using YouTube DL, and uh, it wasn't working. And I looked up a bug because it wasn't, it was giving me a specific error. And the bug said very clearly, do not report a bug or post anything to this bug unless you're using this version or later, because we know about the problem and we fixed it and people are still continuing to report it. So I looked at the version of YouTube DL that was installed in my system. And sure enough, he was right. Uh, didn't work. It wasn't the right version. And so I said to myself, self, we got to figure something out here. And so I went to install the newest version, and that was actually the latest version that was available in my PPA. So uninstalled it from the PPA using the app system and went back and installed the Snap. YouTube deal works perfectly. So uh, that was the first time I've had less problems with the Snap than I've had with a regular install. And I don't say that to beat up on Snaps at all. It's a newer technology. It's just getting rolled out. They're trying to get people on board. So I appreciate everything they're doing. Uh, that's not to rag on Snaps at all. I've just had some interesting issues with them. And so it was good to see that we are starting to make some progress. I will poke a couple people about the Snap for uh, for Mumble. We'll see if we can't get that updated. All right, I want to get to a interview that we have recorded um, back when we were at Red Hat Summit. Now, this lady, 
Melanie Shimano is an absolute go-getter and winner. She is doing some incredible stuff with technology and with Linux and with Raspberry Pis, introducing children to them in the public school system. Melanie is the kind of teacher I wish I had had when I was in school. And uh, she is trying to get more attention for her program and trying to spread the word of what they're trying to do. It's called the Food Computer Program. Here's that audio. Melanie, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us and chat. I guess let's start with this. What is the Food Computer Program? Yeah, so the Food Computer Program is a program that started in Baltimore City Public Schools where we build food computers. Uh, so food computer is essentially like a tabletop greenhouse that's inside of this box um, that's uh, climate controlled with computer programming and robotics. And it's a hydroponic system, so we're growing plants with water and not soil. And cool. essentially we're using like a Raspberry Pi to connect to a temperature sensor, a grow lights, and a fan to kind of control the temperature inside so that we can grow plants in these systems. There's a lot of talk about vertical farming, and so this idea that we can you know, build up rather than out because we've got people that are essentially living on top of each other. Um, are we going to see greater acceptance of that with the next generation? Yeah, I think so. So I think one of the really cool things about the food computer program, and, and so it's a class that we build on like physical computing principles, computer programming in Python, uh, plant science, urban agriculture, engineering, human centered design, like all these components and then say, okay, now you've learned all these things in your academics, like how do you apply this to a project? And then how do you apply that to real life? Um, and so I think one of the things, especially as we see like technology infused into like everything that we're doing um, is that like it's becoming more acceptable to say like what we're doing now has worked until now, but maybe we need more solutions for the future, right? And so if we're saying we've done all these large plots of wheat and barley and all this stuff. Um, but now we have more people living in cities. We need more transportation, getting people to different places. We have um, pockets of places that don't have grocery stores. Like how do we change the way that we're growing food and the way that we're consuming food to like supplement that? So I think um, it, it seems weird. Maybe we're like in a transition state right now. That's like, okay, we need to move from this thing to something new. And we're trying out a bunch of things like food computers, like different vertical farming, which in, in towers or pallets or aquaponics and trying to figure out like, how do we even make one of these a sustainable solution? So I think we're kind of growing into that, but maybe it's not like totally mainstream right now. One of the things that's exciting to me about open source, about Linux, and about open hardware is the fact that there is a sense of empowerment, mm -hmm. right? When you have a Raspberry Pi, for example, what you're talking about, there is no gatekeeper. Anybody can afford a $35 computer. Well, for the most part, in, 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 this, in, uh, in this country, anybody can afford a $35 computer. Mm -hmm. And that gives a sense of empowerment and it removes the gatekeeper from technology. What can we do as technologists to help further that empowerment? Empowerment. Yeah, so I think, and one of the things that I've seen in my classes is that students like love doing this hands-on tech stuff and the open source makes that even more accessible. So if we're saying, okay, you wanna, you've done this thing with the Raspberry Pi, you kind of understand how it works. If you really like this, you can find any community online, you can find a community, probably people who live in Baltimore who are just doing this as a hobby to like help you out. Like there's so much support around that if you just like have one kernel of interest, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the cool things about including this in education is saying, okay, we need to involve technology in different aspects of education um, just because like we're growing into all these things that require technology and haven't really had that support growing into it. And so one of the cool things about open source is that if we need to educate um, educators to say you need to include this in your curriculum, or if we need to say we need more teachers in computer science, um, having like an open source project where there might be developers or people who are hobbyists who've done these projects who can come in and say, I'll help you out with this because I already know how this works. Or uh, maybe not a full-time teacher, but having having that community of technology and apply it to different projects and apply it to education and apply it to potentially like city civic challenges that like the general public could benefit from. So I think having this open source community in general is like great for moving anything forward. Absolutely it is. Yeah. There's an interesting book. It's called Program or Be Program, Ten Commandments for a Digital Age by Douglas Rushkoff. He touches on this concept that we don't learn to control the technology tools that we have at our disposal. And because of that, we in turn become controlled by them. Um, how do we help inspire students to look at technology 
as something that, as a tool that they can use to create something else rather than just walking into Best Buy and saying, what can I spend some money on and take home and play with? Buy like a Raspberry Pi, something that I can use to create something else. Yeah, yeah, that's actually, that's one of the reasons why I started the food computer program is because um, in school I had done a bunch of business plan competitions and uh, like maybe 50 to 75% of all the pitches were something like, we've made, we, we've made an app for this, we've made a website for this, we've made drones to do this thing. And it wasn't really getting at like, actually solving the problem. Um, they're just saying, here's a tech that I know of, people think it's cool, and like you can create something for it because um, I've learned this in my class. And so I think incorporating the technology into stuff and applying it to real projects is something that um, is like totally necessary, right? And so um, incorporating things like Raspberry Pi and like these really hands-on projects that are more than just how do you turn on an LED light or how do you uh, like, use a relay to control something on and off. Like those are really good and you need foundations in computer science and biology and chemistry and stuff to do stuff, but you also need to understand like how that applies to real life. So projects, open source projects like food computers are, I'd say like one of the ideal things to incorporate in a classroom because you say, you've learned this thing, here's a real project that you can create. Like you've learned how to control an LED light with this like simple code uh, connected to GPI opens. Then you say, okay, this is cool for a tiny light, but like, what does that do for you? Uh, how about we connect this to this box farm and you can help plants grow by attaching this grow light to it. So kind of by like infusing these different projects, just like having that in the back of students' minds and say, okay, like I can apply, like helping them bridge that, uh, bridge that connection to like what they do in their classes to real life. And then so hopefully they can go on in the future and say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember when I had to take this and then we did this thing, how about now I take this and do the other thing? You know, like try and um, make small connections throughout the class or throughout their like time in school so that later on when they're trying to problem solve themselves, they, they still have that connection and can relate it to um, something they've done with technology or open source in general. The mainstream media puts a lot of emphasis on limiting screen time, right? Mm -hmm. And we hear that all the time. We need to limit screen time and we don't want kids, we want kids to get outside and play. We don't want them playing on their technology, <laughs> right? And so how do we limit that? And I, not to say that that is an invalid concern because obviously we want kids to get exercise and get out and play and all of those kinds of things. But Charlie Rezing, uh, Rezinger is a, is a technology director for Penn Manor School District in Pennsylvania. And one of the things that he embarked on was this idea to get a one-to-one -one laptop program. So every child has a direct interaction um, with a laptop Laptop, and obviously he's using open source and open hardware to make that happen. What can we do as technologists to promote a stronger emphasis on technology? Not necessarily for games or to, to take away from outdoor activities, but I think it's an important part of our future. How do we promote that in a responsible way? Yeah, and so that's another thing that we kind of do in the food computer program. So we spend time with the basics, we spend time doing food computer, and then we say, what what does this mean for you guys? You as high school students who are who've lived in Baltimore City for the past 17 years, who know all this stuff, like what can you do with this stuff outside of your life? And so I think the solution to saying let's limit screen time, but still uh, keep in line with like how do we improve technology and keep people interested in technology and keep on developing new technology is saying, okay, how do we use technology to, to supplement the other stuff that's going on in our communities. How do we say, okay, we know Baltimore City has a lot of food deserts or like healthy food priority areas, which means like people don't have grocery stores within a certain distance from their house or they don't have like easily easy transport to grocery stores. So like that obviously causes a lot of problems, right? Like health problems, day-to-day -day problems and stuff like that. So if we say, we know that a solution is not for every single person to have a food computer in their house, but if you know about this, how can you apply like food computer principles, I guess, to solving community challenges? And like you as high school students, and then how can you broaden that to the larger community and say, we know these, this local software firm likes to do tech stuff, and we know this Urban Farmers Alliance does farming stuff, and we know that you guys are trying to do stuff in the community. So how do we get like all these different groups of people talking together and like having this like tech literacy um, understanding and then solving other problems on top of that. I think that's kind of the solution of instead of saying we need more people to uh, do tech stuff or we need people to go totally opposite and like don't use any screens, right? And I think that those are two extremes and neither extreme is like, so the solution. We have to find right? a balance. Yeah. yeah, and so I think kind of like understanding how you can supplement the technology to the to the actual problems is kind of like how we can not only like limit the screen time and limit the 
the bad things that are happening because of increasing technology, but also like bringing people together. Because I think that's another thing that when people spend time on their phone, you're not paying attention to the person in front of you or you're not paying attention to like things around you. So in order to kind of like bridge that gap saying you're using technology together to solve this greater problem that is is could be potentially solved without technology, but could be sped up by using the technology and screens and stuff like that. I, I think it was an Einstein quote that we can't solve problems with the exact same thinking as we used to create them, right? And so in the United States, we have a, a set education model. We have grid seating. The teacher stands at the front of the classroom. She projects in, you know, by speaking to the students, and then they are expected to take in. And we know every bit of empirical evidence that we have says that kids learn differently. All people learn differently. And technology can be a part of that because a student can experience something in a hands-on way. They can experience something by listening. They can experience something by reading or by seeing, we can accommodate those different styles of learning. You know, what can technologists do to help up, update the education model that we use here in the United States? Yeah, that's like 100%. I totally agree with all that stuff, especially as we need people to, to fill in these jobs and we need to build pipelines into places that don't traditionally have technology and like need to have people who are experts in technology to do stuff. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to pilot in the food computer program is saying, okay, we know that not everyone is going to be uh, a teacher. Like, not not everyone, not every teacher can learn computer science to like teach something like this, and not everyone who goes into the computer science or programming path is going to stop their job and go back and being a teacher. But how can we like? merge those two together and like have a partnership between maybe uh, local tech firms or even like larger tech firms and school districts or individual schools. So one of the things that I see as a success, as a, as a way to incorporate technology successfully and have, um, and not try to like overburden any one party is to say, okay, we have the, the traditional teacher and say uh, a biology class and say, he or she knows how to manage the classroom, how to, to talk about certain concepts with the students, um, but maybe they don't know about computer programming and how it can be applied to like something that they're doing. So then you bring in a partner from local tech firm and say, uh, we're gonna do some Raspberry Pi stuff, mm -hmm. and it's related to biology. Um, and so you have those two kind of playing off of each other, saying like, this is what I know about technology, this is how it's applied to biology, and have those two kind of merge together. And you can kind of do this with, with any subject, right? You can do this even with like history and talk about like, here's the history of, I don't know, how motors came to be and then play around with motors and stuff like that. And so I think um, kind of making it more of like a community team instead of like a one person approach to solving a problem, which then also benefits the students to say, okay, now I know um, what this person does in their job and this person does in their job and they both know about technology but they both do totally different things or like this man in this job and this woman in this job uh, is something that I never thought of to like think of as a career and so I think kind of involving more people in that way and having the school systems be open to having that type of collaboration and problem solving in the class is as more than like a one-off thing you know it's it's nice to have someone come and talk to the class about their career but if it's a one-time thing it's easy to forget about or it's easy to like doze off and like not really remember. But if you have that consistent like once a week or twice a week kind of person coming into the classroom and, and engaging with the class and engaging with the teacher and having these like fun activities, you're like learning about the actual concept that you're supposed to learn about, but you're also learning about more the world around you and how you can have an impact on it. We forget sometimes, I think as technologists or as developers or system administrators, that the work that we do has real impact, right? And it actually does touch lives. Do you have any examples of real world impacts from students? Yeah, I mean, so I think like almost every day there's something that some student will say like, oh wow, that's cool. or like. Or they'll, they'll say something and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe you made that connection without like me even like leading into that. Um, I think one of the most recent examples, so my students uh, had run a pop-up restaurant at a local food hall in Baltimore City. Um, and they basically took over this pop-up stall for the entire weekend and they made a, a build your own panini restaurant. And then they used the, oh, wow. yeah, it was really fun. And they took the, so we had a bunch of food computers and like a food computer room in our, it's like a room scaled food computer in the basement of our school. And they grow, they grew basil, kale, cilantro, and parsley. And then we used that to make sauces for the panini sandwiches. Um, <laughs> so it was like super fun. And like building up to it, we had to do a lot of prep and we had to be like, how do we think about marketing? How do we think about prepping for food? How do we think about the recipes and standardizing and menus? And I think like throughout the process, the students were kind of like, we had gone a field trip to the food hall and they had seen it and it's like a really cool trendy place. And so they knew kind of what was happening, but I don't think they really thought uh, 
anyone would come to the restaurant besides their parents. <laughs> and so, sure. so building up to it, they were just like, okay, this is cool, and like we're prepping, but like we're gonna only sign up for one shift because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And the first day we get there, uh, we're setting everything up, and the restaurant's supposed to open at 11, and there's like three people waiting out at 10.30. Like, are you guys open? Like, can we order something? And they're like, okay, like we can start making stuff now. And like, as they start making stuff, there's like a line that builds up. And one of my students like nudges the other student and she's like, hey, like, look at all these people, like, we're success. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, this is like what it's about. It's like not necessarily about the tech, it's about like how you do stuff and how it leads to other stuff and then how you just like, ooh, this is cool. Like, I wanna keep doing more stuff so that I can do more stuff. That is you know? awesome, <laughs> absolutely awesome. Melanie, thanks so much for coming on and for what you're doing with to help inspire children and to help lead the next generation of technologists and promote open source, promote open hardware and using a creative, uh, a creative approach to education. We really appreciate it. We'll get you back on the program soon. Yeah, thank you so much, this has been awesome. <laughs> The uh, and a huge thanks to Melanie for sitting down and the the incredible work she's doing. We're really happy to to feature her on the program. By the way, if you want to see the video portion of that interview, that is part of our all new Linux focused video content. You can find that by heading over to either mindrootmedia.com or youtube.com slash mindrootmedia. Uh, the video portion of that interview will be posted there later this week. A uh, we don't have a ton of time to dig into this in the depth and breadth that I would like to, but the Entorgos project is coming to an end. Uh, from their blog post, quote, when started a, what started as a summertime hobby seven years ago quickly grew into an awesome Linux distribution with even more awesome community around it. Our goal is to make Arch Linux available to a wider audience of users by providing a streamlined user interface that included a safe place for users to communicate, learn, and help one another. There have been 931,439 unique downloads of Targos since 2014, and we began keeping track. We think it's safe to say we've accomplished our goal. So today we're announcing the end of the project. As many of you probably have noticed over the several, past several months, we no longer have enough free time to maintain a proper Antargos system. And we've come to this decision because we believe that continuing to neglect the problem would be a huge disservice to the community. And taking this action now, while the project's code still works, provides an opportunity for interested developers to take what they find useful and start their own projects. So this is really too bad because Integros is, is one of the is one of the projects that made Arch usable for me, and I think made Arch usable for day-to-day -day users. If you're a business user and have any interest in using Integros, you or you want to use Arch, you have to basically use Entargos or something like it because you need a way to simply just install your operating system and run. And so I think it fills a very large gap in between uh, build my own system, everything from scratch, and, and everything is prepackaged and predecided and, and slow to roll out. So every distro has problems. Every operating system, for that matter, has problems. The nice thing about Arch is that their community is so focused on solving problems that, quite frankly, uh, you would never know how many problems Linux-wide are solved by Arch people. And so to see the Integris project go by the wayside is a real loss, I think, to the community. I'm not sure if they're open to somebody picking that up. If so, I think that would be a really good decision uh, and, and a really valuable contribution back to the community. I want to get to a piece of feedback, of course, your feedback at live at asknoahshow.com. We take it at the end of every program. A uh, emailer writes, hello, Noah. First of all, thanks so much for your dedication and enthusiasm and everything you do for Linux and open source and free software. I was listening to the last episode of Ask Noah, and I heard a listener asking for a project management system. I wanted to recommend Gantt, G-A-N-N-T, Gantt tools on Linux, short of the ones you mes mes mentioned. I think it's worth to check out the Gantt project. You can find more at gantproject.biz, B-I-Z, G-A-N-T-T-P-R-O-G, J-E-C-T dot biz. It's free for personal and business use. It's cross-platform, very easy to learn, and very lightweight. It might not be the most feature-rich management tool, but it does work great and is probably enough for small to medium-sized projects without much overhead to learn it. Obviously, the project accepts donations, so it would be great to inform anybody using them that a small contribution goes a long way, but I probably don't need to tell you that. I hope this is helpful. Mario. And so thanks very much for sending that in. Of course, the thing that makes the Ask Noah Show program great is the fact that the community that has built up around it and people like you who are willing to help one another. And so we appreciate that. By the way, if you'd like the kind of support and community building that you see going on during the program, then we invite you to join our interactive Telegram group. You can do that by going to telegram.asknoahshow.com. And there you can join what we're calling the Geek Lab. And it is an interactive 24-7 uh, community that helps other people get 
involved in state in Linux. And uh, the, the one of the stories I was really excited to get to, and we just frankly just ran out of time, is Google Glass E2. Uh, the Enterprise Edition 2 is finally launching. And anybody who knows me for any prolonged period of time knows that I was a huge fan, a huge fan of Google Glass. And if anybody knows how I can buy the Enterprise 2 Glass, I will do it today. I'll pay full MSRP. I don't have a problem with that. I'll pay above MSRP. Uh, but I contacted Google using their contact form. I tried contacting every partner that they had listed on the page. I cannot seem to get a response on how to actually purchase the stupid thing. So if anybody knows how to purchase the Google Enterprise Glass 2, I would love to do that. We'll have a link to Google's announcement as well as a blog post that Google did in the show notes. You can check that out because I really think that is one of the most undervalued projects uh, Google has ever done. Absolutely transformed my life in a very good way. The ability to capture pictures, to capture videos of your kids doing ridiculous, adorable, cute things that you just don't have a chance to reach down in your pocket to grab a phone. Just can't put a price on that. Hey guys, did you know all of the articles and references that we mentioned in this show are available at podcast.asknoahshow? You gotta go check that out. Also visit our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash minddripmedia and follow them on Twitter at minddripmedia. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday, 6 p.m. Central. See you next week, everybody. 6 p.m. Ask Noah Show dot com.